After an afternoon of sunshine and showers, northern England will see a dry evening with skies turning increasingly clear. Just like elsewhere, it will be a chilly end to the day with a frost forming. Moving into Scotland and the showers will continue across some northern and eastern areas with these wintry across the higher ground. Elsewhere, there will be some late sunshine to end the day. And Northern Ireland will also see some late sunshine and apart from the odd, very isolated shower, it will be a dry end to the day for most. Overnight, most will be dry and clear, leading to a cold night with widespread frost developing, especially in the countryside. And that is how the weather is shaping up overnight and into tomorrow morning. Join me, Darren Grimes, for Real Britain every Saturday and Sunday from 2 p.m. A news hour that comes with a trigger warning. Scorching hot opinion with prominent guests saying the unsayable and a little bit of weekend fun thrown in. Unlike other broadcasters, I won't be forgetting what the B in our name stands for. So how are you in for Real Britain, Saturday and Sunday from 2pm? Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering. As their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Good afternoon. It's just gone six o'clock. I'm Bethany Elsie in the GB newsroom. Boris Johnson has met with President Volodymyr Zelensky in Ukraine's capital, Kiev, in a show of solidarity with the country. The Prime Minister made the surprise trip to set out a new package of financial and military aid. Downing Street says Britain has agreed to send 120 armoured vehicles and new anti-ship missile systems to support Ukraine's armed forces. The UK will also remove tariffs on the vast majority of imports from Ukraine. President Zelensky has described Boris Johnson as one of the most principled opponents of the Russian invasion. Meanwhile, Ukrainian officials have urged civilians in the eastern region of Luhansk to flee as Russia is amassing new forces. The governor there warned that Russia is preparing a new offensive as shelling increased in recent days. Ukraine has been warning that Russia plans intensified attacks in the country's east and south after withdrawing its troops from the areas of the north of Kiev. President Zelensky said the country was preparing for a tough battle ahead.
Russian forces are being gathered in the east and south. A large amount of forces, equipment and armed people who are preparing to occupy yet another part of our territory. This will be a tough battle. We believe in this fight and our victory. We are ready to simultaneously fight and to look for a diplomatic solution that can put an end to this war. In other news, Labour says the Chancellor and his family have potentially saved tens of millions of pounds in taxes due to his wife's non-DOM status. The Chancellor's wife, Akshata Murthy, has said she will now pay UK tax on all her worldwide income, despite the status exempting her from doing so. It's as Rishi Sunak admitted to holding a US green card while in office. He said it was returned after he sought guidance and that he followed all laws and paid taxes in full. The royal family has released a poetic tribute to mark the first anniversary of the Duke of Edinburgh's death. The poem, written by poet laureate Simon Armitage, is called The Patriarchs and Elegy. He died on this day last year at Windsor Castle, just months short of his 100th birthday. Husbands to duty, they unrolled their plans across billiard tables and vehicle bonnets, regrouped at breakfast. What their secrets were, was everyone's guess and nobody's business. Great grandfathers from birth, in time they became both in a core and outer case in a family heirloom of nesting dolls. Labour is calling for the government to intervene at airports and ferry operators to avoid more Easter travel chaos. Shadow Transport Secretary Louise Haig is urging ministers to prioritise Manchester Airport, where passengers are being asked to arrive three hours in advance to avoid missing their flight. And in Dover, over 2,000 lorries are in queues of up to 20 miles long, whilst ferry crossings are also affected. And against the odds, at 50 to 1, Noble Yates has won this year's Grand National at Aintree. Trained by Emmett Mullins, the seven-year-old horse beat 15 to 2 favourite any second now to pip the post. Delta Work was third. Noble Yates was ridden by amateur Sam Whaley Cohen on his last ever ride, taking the title from last year's winner Rachel Blackmore on Millenna Times. The jockey described his win as a fairy tale. On TV, online and DB Plus Radio, this is GB News. We'll have more news at the top of the next hour. Looking ahead to this evening's weather and the UK is looking bright for many with the majority of the showers fading away. Let's take a look at the details. Zooming into the southwest of England and it will be a fine end to the day here with plenty of sunshine. It will quickly begin to feel chilly though once the sun begins to set. Moving eastwards and there could be one or two showers around first thing this evening but these will quickly ease away leaving clear skies. Across then into Wales and any showers will fade away with most of the cloud also melting away, leaving a clear but chilly evening. Any showers across the Midlands will tend to become confined to northern and eastern parts with skies largely clear elsewhere. Once the sun sets, skies will clear further, giving a cold night for all. After an afternoon of sunshine and showers, northern England will see a dry evening with skies turning increasingly clear. Just like elsewhere, it will be a chilly end to the day with a frost forming. Moving into Scotland and the showers will continue across some northern and eastern areas with these wintry across the higher ground. Elsewhere, there will be some late sunshine to end the day. And Northern Ireland will also see some late sunshine and apart from the odd very isolated shower it will be a dry end to the day for most. Overnight most will be dry and clear leading to a cold night with widespread frost developing especially in the countryside and that is how the weather is shaping up overnight and into tomorrow morning. Hello, it's Saturday, which means it's time for the Saturday selection. Coming up on today's show, we sit down for an exclusive interview with the Prime Minister and discuss Ukraine, Covid and whether we could ever see the country going into lockdown again. 
TV producer and creator of Grange Hill, Sir Phil Redmond, joins us to discuss the sell-off of Channel 4. But first, joining us with her Saturday selection of the stories from this week's papers is journalist and broadcaster Nina Mishkoff. Wonderful to see you Good today. To Lovely to see you, Esther. So what's caught your eye this week, Nina? Well, the thing is, what, whatever you discuss, you cannot ignore the Ukraine situation. That, that consumes us all. It consumes every news programme. Um, you know, you, you can't watch without being completely obsessed with it or traumatised by it. I mean, uh, so people have been sitting there in front of their tellies like me saying, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? And when the um, Homes for Refugees was, uh, scheme was announced, I mean, the British people are wonderful. They are so generous. Within days, 100,000 people were offering their homes, and now it's up to 200,000. But the problem is that the Home Office has actually impeded this, this wonderful generosity. These, these are people fleeing from a war zone. Mm -hmm. They've lost their homes, their families, their lives, their country, everything. They're traumatised. You know, these are women and children. That, you know, the husbands, the partners are, are fighting. They don't know whether they're going to see them again or they're going to see their country again. What possible threat can these people pose to our country? Uh, and yet, you know, there are these horrendous stories coming out of... Um, people waiting, you know, four weeks in Poland, th five weeks in Paris. You know, they cannot somehow get through the visa system. The v visa is a logjam. And I noticed an interesting thing in The Times today, in The Times editorial, which is it's, it's um, control versus compassion. And, you know, we are humiliated and shamed by our... I feel that, by our country's lack of response. Um, and, and, and the shambles... It's, the, the Home Office is completely shambolic. I mean, the fact that they couldn't organise it, something better. I don't know if you know this, but there's the, the, the company running the 24-hour the helpline for the refugee schemes is called Teleperformance. And it's owned... By, it's a French-owned company. Now, because it's a French-owned company, it means it is barred from ac accessing the Home Office database for security reasons. Now, why would the Home Office give this job, knowing that this was going to happen, to a French-based company? It's, it seems utterly outrageous. I don't understand it. So, what, what did you see? What did you see this week? Oh, I'm saving mine till the end. Oh, okay. I'm saving All mine right. till well, the end. In which case, I'm going to jump in. And the story, Nina, that caught my eye this week was about uh, a potential summer of discontent. Uh, it was in the Times this week, and basically, it was making the point that uh, people like BT have been giving pay rises of five percent to their staff, highest pay rises for years and years. Uh, Tesco, I think, were 5.7%. But, of course, all of these pay rises are below the rate of inflation. Completely wiped out. And, and, and obviously, the cost of living is going through the roof. And this is barely scratching the surface for people who are mm. struggling to pay their energy bills. And the speculation in The Times this week was whether or not we may see a summer of discontent where groups of workers in the public sector and the private sector sort of go out on strike, mass strike action, in order to try and get inflation... Uh, uh, inflation uh, beating. beating, sorry, yeah, inflation beating pay rises, or at least matching inflation, because at the moment people are really struggling and pay rises aren't keeping pace. Well, exactly. And then what about the pensioners who the, yes, the triple absolutely. lock was removed? So the pensioners are at the really sharp end of things that they have absolutely, and pensioners are the least likely to be able to, to supplement their, their, their meagre pensions. No, there's, you know, there's also, it's always starting the spring of discontent. Look at, look at the, well, if you have the money to get away and go on holiday, can you get out the airport? No. Don't even go, no, don't no, even no, go no, there. No, no. It's a, it is a, it is a nightmare what's going on. And it's because they hadn't worked for however, you know, many years. They're now coming back. They've now got to find staff. They've got to go through the security checks. They're not up to speed. And yet they're thinking customers can come through. So there's actual sort of bottlenecks at every part. Security sets, uh, security uh, systems, you know, signing on. Absolute shambles. The thing, the thing this story didn't mention, though, was that actually if people go on uh, strike, of course, they don't get paid while they're on strike. So people That's might true. be reluctant to to go on strike if they're struggling so much to pay the bill. So it's, a, it's, it's not an easy option, is it, going on strike? It's depending on the strength of how many people. Uh, but, but, you know, it, it is, it is a, a dreadful situation. And, you know, COVID has played a part. People are just ignoring that. People say, we have to live with COVID. But, you, but we can't ignore it. You know, COVID has caused all these absences because, I mean, I don't, if you know, I know so many people who have it. 
And so many people who have it for the second time is the other thing. And it's, it's no point saying, oh, it's just a cold. Some people get away with it like that, but other people really suffer. And, and, and you know, it's not just a, an easy thing. You know, you get the brain fog, never mind long COVID. And it causes, people say, you know, we, sh you sh we shouldn't be sort of, you know, um, pathetic and babyish about this. Oh, we can all carry on. But if there are... If there are huge numbers of cases, it, it, it completely backfires on, on, the, on the workforce mm. and on all the services. I mean, that can only, that's why we have all these bottlenecks. Come on, Esther. Okay, then this is, on, this is the one it. I've been saying for, and this was uh, the short King Spring is here. And what this is all about, it is uh, users of TikTok, 340 million viewers of them are absolutely obsessed now uh, with shorter blokes. So in the past, it had been tall, dark and handsome. Now it is short, dark and handsome. It is the age of the short guy. And why is that? It's down to uh, people like film stars like Tom Holland, and Joe Janus, but also now, there we go, uh, Tom Holland there with his taller uh, girlfriend, uh, Zendaya. But we've also got now uh, Zelensky, who's only five foot seven. And this now are what people are looking, you know, ladies are looking for, five foot seven, there he is. But we've got a list, because I also then was curious, how tall are our leaders around the world? So we've got Boris Johnson, five foot seven. So he would be a king, a short king. And this is under five foot eight. We've got uh, Macron's, uh, um, he says he's five foot nine. Some of us question that. He could be five foot eight. We've got uh, Sarkozy, five uh, foot five. We've got Putin, five foot six. And the shortest there is King John Un at five foot three. So we've got all of these Same world... Same me. <laughs> <laughs> we've, got, we've got all of these world leaders there uh, who are tiny, tiny uh, people there. So there's one thing to say... And this is what they say, short men make good husbands, but taller men make a, for a better fling or for a better short-term partner. So what I'd say is if you want a long-term relationship, go for a short guy. But if you want a short-term relationship, you can go for a, a tall guy. Um, I, I don't you didn't explain why you went for me, whether it's because I was tall, short, handsome, dark. Well, I used to be dark. It's <laughs> uh, a long time ago, to Phil, be honest. It had to be because you were tall, dark and handsome. Thank you so much. Now short and grey and... <laughs> yeah. and fat. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Nina. Now, uh, earlier this week, we sat down with the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, in a wide-ranging exclusive interview covering his handling of the pandemic and the current situation in Ukraine. And it's been two years since he was hospitalised with COVID. We began the interview by looking back to March 2020 when he announced he'd tested positive. And we'll go live now to the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who's giving the address in Kiev following his meeting with President Vladimir Zelensky. Ти тут, і велике тобі подяка від нас всіх, від народу України. Цей візит прояв дійсно рішучою, вагомою, постійної підтримки України з боку Великої Британії. І ми це цінуємо, і ми завжди будемо це пам'ятати. Буквально нещодавно ми з тобою бачились тут, у Києві, і сьогодні згадував ти це, підбували підсумки нашої спільної роботи в режимі стратегічного діалогу, планували майбутні проекти між нашими державами, оглядали Київ, і сьогодні ти на власні очі бачиш, як виглядає... And that's Boris Johnson meeting with President Vladimir Zelensky in the capital, Kiev. He made a surprise visit earlier today. Um, in a, what we're expecting him to say is that uh, he'll continue to intensify sanctions on Russia week by week. Um, he also has promised that the UK will provide support so that Ukraine will never be invaded again. As you can see, that's Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky speaking there in Kiev. We'll bring you more on this as it happens, um, and we'll bring you an update when the Prime Minister Boris Johnson speaks. Democratic 
до Британії час запровадити повне ембарго на російські енергоносії, збільшити надання нам усієї зброї. Народ України цінує підтримку Великої Британії на нашому шляху до миру. І ми були єдині з паном прем'єр-міністром у тому, що необхідно. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky speaking there in the capital, Kyiv. He's doing a press conference with uh, the UK's Prime Minister Boris Johnson. We're just going to go to a short break now and we'll come back to you in just a moment. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering as their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets, and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss, and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation. Afternoon. It's almost 20 past six. We're going to cut to a press conference in the Ukraine's capital, Paris. Kiev now, where Boris Johnson uh, is speaking. The defense intelligence that we had suggested that the Russians believed that Ukraine could be engulfed in a matter of days and that Kiev would fall in hours uh, to, their, uh, to their armies. And how wrong they were. And I think that uh, the Ukrainians have shown the courage of a lion, but you, Volodymyr, have given the roar of that lion. And I thank you for what you've been able uh, to do. I think your leadership has been extraordinary. And I think in what Putin has done in places like Bucha and in Irpin, uh, his war crimes have permanently polluted his reputation and the reputation of his, of his government. And it's clear, we, we discuss this at length, it's clear that what he is doing now, he, he has suffered a, a reverse, but his retreat is tactical. And he's going to intensify the pressure now in Donbass and in the East. And so that's why it's so vital, as you rightly say, of Volodymyr, that we, your friends, continue to offer whatever support uh, that we can. And together with our partners, we are going to ratchet up the economic pressure and we will continue to intensify uh, week by week the sanctions on, on Russia. Uh, not just freezing assets in, in banks and, uh, uh, and sanctioning oligarchs, but moving away from uh, use of Russian hydrocarbons. And we will give you the support that you need, the economic support, but also, of course, the defensive military support, in which I'm proud to say that the UK helped to, to lead the way. And uh, just the other day, uh, we raised, uh, I think, £1.5 billion at a donor conference from friends, partners around the world, dozens and dozens of countries who now want 
uh, to support Ukraine. We want to liberalize trade with Ukraine as we go forward to help your economic circumstances, barley uh, and other commodities. The, there are things we should be doing. Uh, we want to help you with demining your country, getting rid of the savage traps that the Russian armies have left behind. And to come to your, your central point, Volodymyr, I think we are evolving a vision now for the future. Heraclitus, I think, said war is the father of all things. I mean, that was an exaggeration. War isn't the father of everything. But what this war is certainly producing is a clarity about the vision of a future uh, for Ukraine, where together with friends and partners, we, the UK and others, supply the equipment, the technology, the, the know-how, the intelligence, so that Ukraine will never be invaded again. So that Ukraine is so fortified and so protected that Ukraine can never be bullied again, never be blackmailed again, never be threatened in the same way again. In the meantime, there is a huge amount to do to make sure that Ukraine is successful, that Ukraine wins, and that Putin must fail. Over the last few hours, I've been able to see quite a lot of your beautiful country. And it's an amazing country. I've also seen the tragic effects of the war, an inexcusable war, an absolutely inexcusable and unnecessary war. But having been here in Kiev just for a few hours, I have absolutely no doubt, Volodymyr, listening to you, listening to your team, your redoubtable team, I have no doubt at all that an independent, sovereign Ukraine will rise again. Thanks above all to the heroism, the courage of the people of Ukraine. Thank you very much and Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Thank you. was speaking at a press conference alongside Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, the British Prime Minister said that during a visit to Kiev, uh, while, while he was there meeting with Vladimir Zelensky in person, that countries supporting Ukraine following the invasion would continue to tighten economic sanctions week by week. Uh, I'll quote him now. He said, together with our partners, we are going to ratchet up economic pressure against Russia and we will continue to intensify week by week the sanctions against the country. Um, Mr Johnson said the measures would include moving away from the use of Russian hydrocarbons. We will bring you more on that uh, in about half an hour. But now we're just going to take a short break. Actually, I'm going to give you the latest news at uh, 25 minutes past six. Downing Street has said that Britain is to send 120 armoured vehicles and new anti-ship missile systems to support Ukraine following talks between Boris Johnson and President Vladimir Zelensky in Kiev. The Prime Minister said he made his surprise visit to Ukraine's capital as a show of our unwavering support for the people of Ukraine. He said he'll continue to intensify sanctions on Russia week by week and that the UK will move away from using Russian hydrocarbons. He also said the UK will provide support so that Ukraine will never be invaded again. Meanwhile, Ukrainian officials have urged civilians in the eastern region of Luhansk to flee as Russia is amassing new forces. The governor there is warning that Russia is preparing a new offensive as shelling has increased in recent days. Ukraine has been warning that Russia plans intensified attacks in the country's east and south after withdrawing its troops from areas north of Kiev. In other news, a Dutch teenager who disappeared after going diving off the coast of Malaysia has died. That's according to his British father. Officials say 14-year-old Nathan Chesters has now likely drifted into Indonesian waters. He and his father were in a group of four who went missing on Wednesday afternoon when they were on a training dive. The other divers have been rescued. And against the odds at 50-1, Noble Yates has won this year's Grand National at Aintree. 
Uh, trained by Emmett Mullins, the seven-year-old horse beat 15-2 to two favourite any second now to pip the post. Delta Work was third. Noble Yates was ridden by amateur Sam Whaley Cohen on his last ever ride, taking the title from last year's winner Rachel Blackmore on Manila Times. The jockey described his win as a fairy tale. On TV, online and DB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to Saturday Selection. Welcome back to the Saturday Selection. Now, the government has announced plans to privatise Channel 4, with Culture Secretary Nadine Doris saying the current government ownership is holding the channel back. Channel 4 was launched in 1982, and despite being a government-owned broadcasting company, does not receive any public funding, getting its money through advertisements. There have been suggestions that the channel could be worth between £600 million and £1.5 billion, and bids are expected to come in next year with aims of completing the sale in 2024. Well, joining us now to discuss this move is the TV producer and creator of iconic TV show Grange Hill, as well as Channel 4 famous programmes like <laughs> Hollyoaks and Brookside, Sir Phil Redmond. Phil, thank you so much for joining us. What, what do you make of this potential sale of Channel 4? Um, well, I think I've, I've, I've said um, since they since they uh, cancelled Brookside, I think I've been talking about they need a change, but I've become a less emotional about it over the years. I think um, everybody's just got carried away a bit by the word privatisation. Um, I think what we should be really talking about is a, cha a change of ownership, um, and perhaps moving it out from being a publicly funded uh, independent uh, channel to uh, something else. Um, my preferred option would have been to sort of collapse it into the BBC to get rid of all the admin costs of actually running the channel, but use the uh, income to subsidise the licence fee. But, you know, you can talk about perhaps giving it back to ITV, selling it to ITV, because that was originally what the intent of the fourth channel, as it was originally called, uh, was, was to give ITV another uh, channel to compete with BBC One and BBC Two. You've got STV and you've got ITV, so I don't think we should worry about the term privatisation. What we should be thinking about is it's time for change. Mm -hmm. You were there at the beginning of Channel 4. Why was it set up? Because there were lots of reasons it was set up at the time. And why were you excited to be a part of this station? <laughs> well, I, I think it came back to the fact there's a legendary TV writer called Alan Plater who's, who described the BBC, uh, the BBC drama department, as one room with nine doors. Um, and so it was always like, very difficult to get new ideas and things through. So the idea of having a new channel that would actually provide 30% more airtime, it would allow you know a lot more people, a lot more new ideas, new techniques, uh, new views, new opinions on. And there was two things really. One was to create a channel that would allow voices that had not previously been heard uh, and to give them a platform and create an independent production sector. But the second uh, big um, sort of like aim of Channel 4 was to create a competition within the advertising market because there was only ITV who had this kind of sole monopoly of ITV, of uh, advertising on television. And so again, that was what Channel 4 was. And that's what I meant about going back to ITV because in the early days, uh, ITV actually sold the advertising on Channel 4 but had no control over the programming. Um, so I think, you know, we've got to, again, keep always coming back to the original remit. It was to create a new channel with new ideas, new programs, but also to break the monopoly on advertising revenue. Uh, that's moved on now. Um, there's so many platforms, so many opportunities for people to advertise. You know, we're still sort of uh, working our way through monetizing the digital age. So... I think what and we you, really need to think quite, about... And you're what, quite right, Phil, because, I mean, uh, Mrs Thatcher brought it in, one, to get the private mm -hmm. sector up and running, all the new small production companies like yourself, and also to show yeah. that, you know, a public sector a company like the BBC didn't need all this public money. It didn't need that four and a half billion or what have you. But, but going forward... If it is sold off, would you like terms and stipulations to go with that uh, selling off? I know you tried to bring Channel 4 to Liverpool. Do you think it should therefore be outside London, sell the London building? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's it. If you want to 
bring a real change into broadcasting, you should actually make it part of the condition of sale that the whole thing has to be outside London. I mean, Channel 4 had tried to adapt and tried to, um, you know, react to the government's desire to move out and, uh, in fact, join up with the levelling up agenda by creating offices in Leeds and Glasgow and places. But, you know, the, the sort of corporate heart and the kind of like spirit of the channel still stays in London. So I think if you are going to go down this route and say it needs to be sold off some, in some shape or form, uh, well, it has to be based outside London in the north somewhere. And obviously, you know, the best place for it would be in the centre of the creative universe in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> so, Phil Redmond, you've got it right. And it's definitely the centre of the uh, of the creative arts today, isn't it, with the Grand National? So you're spot on. So thank Absolutely. you uh, for joining us. Uh, coming up next, the rest of our exclusive interview with the Prime Minister. Stay with us to hear what he had to say on locking down the country and whether he'd do the same thing. Again. This and much more next. Don't go anywhere. Europe is in the grip of the most devastating humanitarian crisis since World War II. The people of Ukraine are facing unimaginable suffering as their homes are destroyed and their loved ones are killed. Millions of people are being forced to flee for their lives, carrying only their children, their pets, and the clothes on their back. The pain, loss, and destruction grows by the day. The people of Ukraine urgently need our help. Already, a vast humanitarian operation is underway. Britain's Disasters Emergency Committee, or DEC, brings together 15 leading aid charities to respond to overseas disasters quickly and efficiently. These charities include the British Red Cross, CARE, Oxfam, Save the Children and World Vision. Their teams are working on the ground in Ukraine and neighbouring countries to bring vital aid to those who need it most. If you can spare it, your gift to the DEC's humanitarian appeal will go a really long way. £10 provides essential hygiene supplies for a person for a month. £50 provides blankets for four families. £100 provides emergency food for two families per month. It's easy to give. You can donate online at dec.org.uk or call the 24-hour donation line on 0370 60 60 900. If you prefer to send a cheque, please post it to the Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal, PO Box 999, London, EC 3A 3AA. To give £10 on your mobile, simply text the word CRISIS to 70 150. Standard network charges apply for calls and you must be 16 or over. Texts are charged at the standard network rate and your £10 donation will be added to your bill. 100% of your donation goes directly to the DEC to save lives and deliver critical support where it's needed. Welcome back to the Saturday Selection on GB News. Earlier this hour, we brought you part one of our exclusive sit-down interview with the Prime Minister Boris Johnson, where he spoke to us about his experience with COVID-19 and hospitalisation. The Prime Minister also spoke to us about handling COVID and the prospects of future lockdowns. Let's have a look at what he had to say. You always strike people as being the least sort of likely to be a nanny state Prime Minister, and yet as a result, large possibly of what you went through, we're, we're having this thing where we're banning special offers on products that the Department of Health considers to be unhealthy. We're, okay, Philip, we're telling supermarkets you know, where they can put product, which products they can put on which shelves and whatever. So the, we've the modified would be, some of that in deference to your wishes. See, he's getting well now. He's, he's getting that. well. He's can modified can some I, of I, the nanny can state I just come stuff. Back? Can I just say, because I know that I'm not a nanny state man. I don't Ooh. believe in it. I don't believe in it. And if we, we've got to move away from it, if, if, because COVID was a COVID, we had to look after people. We had to look after people. Uh, we really, really did. And I think that, you know, the history of all plagues and diseases shows that the public overwhelmingly want government to take decisions uh, to, to avert the, the worst consequences for everybody. Because although people believe in their own personal responsibility, they don't necessarily believe in the sense of personal responsibility of the person next door. And that's the problem when it comes to a pandemic. And that's why government... Uh, has to act. And 
that was, I'm afraid, the, 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 the job we had to do. It wasn't easy. Um, on, on buy one, get one free offers and, and Terry's chocolate oranges, which I know that uh, you are quite... 40% of all products in properly, shops. Quite properly addicted to. Uh, and they're, and they're, <laughs> let me just say, do you know how much fatter we are post-COVID, the, the, I think I saw a figure the, the other day, uh, this is all, I'm giving you this exclusively, okay? Uh, I think there's 36% more obesity. I think, that can that possibly be right? It's huge. There's been a huge increase in obesity uh, as a result of, uh, or 36% of people are fatter than they were. Maybe it's that, maybe it's, that's probably a more accurate way of expressing the, uh, the, the statistic. And, and, and we were already, before the thing began, Philip, we were already the fattest nation in, uh, in Europe, with the possible exception of the Maltese. Mm. Uh, and that is a massive charge on the taxpayer. So can I look uh, and, at this? And so, we, so you and I, Philip, already, always, always defend the taxpayer. And the taxpayer is coughing up huge quantities for the consequences of that uh, obesity. And I, uh, I'm no advertisement for, <laughs> for willpower, uh, but, but it, it is, but we need to, we need to, we need to, we need to recognize the effects of, the effects of, of, uh, of obesity on, on our, on our, on our taxes. So if we talk about lockdown and what happened because of lockdown, you've just given us an example there that obesity has gone up considerably. So obesity for some and mental the, health issues. And mental health. So for a lot of us, we always said there's a cost of COVID and you rightly stood in and protected. We also said there's a cost of lockdown too, and we're looking at that now, whether it is the amount 400 billion uh, impact on the public's finances, we look at the mental health, we look at the damning Ofsted report of what happened to children through lockdown. So I want to ask, was enough consideration given as you were looking at COVID and lockdown, was enough consideration given to lockdown and what you were doing during lockdown? The only, what I would say is if you look at us now, Esther, and you look at what we did, you know what Rishi did with that very prompt, very far reaching furlough program, all the bounce back loans, all the things that we did. What it did was it protected British jobs, protected British industry, protected British business. So that it put, it put us in a state where we were able to bounce out of it in the way that we have. And that's why we've got the economy growing in the way that uh, we've been able to, to do, uh, fastest in the G7 uh, for, for 21, uh, the youth unemployment, low, uh, I think at a, a record low, uh, 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 people on payroll. Massive job vacancies though, over a million. Well, exactly. Yeah. But wow. we, we, we grew up as, uh, well, you're younger than me, but, but when, <laughs> I, when, I, when I was growing up as a, as a, as a conservative, the, the horrifying thing was mass unemployment. And it was, million, you know, it was millions of people in the 80s and, and 90s who, who had the devastating effect on their self-esteem, their self-belief of feeling that the society, the economy had no place for them. And that was a terrible thing. What we've got now is a uh, shortage of, of, of labor. Uh, we've, got, we've got probably 500,000 pairs of hands short in the, in the economy. And what we're doing is getting people into work. Oh, well, lockdowns just had a huge impact on the economy. Yeah. Just coming it back has, to, yeah. just coming back has, to yeah. Esther's point, um, Jacob Rees-Mogg said recently that he thought some of the restrictions that were introduced were inhuman. Um, would you would you agree with that? that he referred to the, the, the people separating I, a mother and, and, and son at a funeral. I, I do you, do you I, consider I, some I, of them I to do, be? I do, human? and I think that some of. The, well, I mean, I understand why people feel that, and I think that uh, people felt particularly the loss of the inability, the loss of the ability to uh, to see their loved ones in in care homes or, or uh, it, it, to to meet properly for for funerals or, I mean, it was just appalling uh, to, to say nothing of, of the loss of, uh, of religious services that matter so much to, to, to people's uh, spirit. Um, so I totally, I totally, I totally understand so if that. We had a lot, if we had a pandemic again, would you go into mm. a full lockdown? I, uh, I want to avoid any such thing ever happening again. And uh, I can't rule out something as I can't you know say that we wouldn't be forced to do uh, non pharmaceutical interventions again of the kind that we we did uh, but I think we've learned a lot and 
I think we would we we would really try to go for um, uh, the earliest possible program of inoculation and uh, uh, vaccination. And that's the, that was, but not that was, the lockdowns again. Look, I, I think it would be irresponsible of any leader, uh, you know, any in any democracy, to say that they're going to rule out something that could save life. And I believe that the things that we did saved lives. There could be, I've got to be absolutely frank with you. There could be a new variant, more deadly. Uh, there could be a variant that affects children uh, badly. Uh, that we really need to contain. Uh, I'm not going to take any options off the, off the table, but I don't think it will happen. I think we're now in the phase of, and this is the, the view of um, uh, all, all the advisors I talk to, that we're now in the phase where the, the virus is, 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 is losing its, uh, its potency uh, overall, and we've got a massively vaccinated uh, UK population. What we need to do is, is double down on that. Let's return to Henry Hill for more reaction to the Prime Minister's comments on lockdown. Henry, the thing that struck me about that section was that he started off by saying, I'm not a nanny state man, and then gave a justification for all nanny state measures that he was introducing. And then he seemed to agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg that some of the lockdowns, um, things that were introduced were inhuman, but then refused to rule out a future lockdown. What, what did you make of what he said? Well, I think this just shows how the pandemic sort of changed Boris Johnson, because he, he he's maybe an instinctual libertarian and he still wants to think of himself that way. But as you said, as he said, you know, a lot of these facts about obesity that he's now using to justify these measures and you know, restricting food sales and everything else, they were the case before the pandemic when he was busy being a libertarian. And if, if you genuinely believe in freedom of choice and that kind of thing, then it shouldn't really matter. So he's kind of conceded the principles of the other side of the argument. And this is why I think that when he says, oh, I'm the same man I was before, you know, conservative free market conservatives especially can take that with a pinch of salt. So should we judge him on what he says or what he does? Judge every politician by their, by their actions every time. So he is a nanny state man? I would say so. Mm. In the last part of our exclusive interview with the Prime Minister, we discussed the ongoing Partygate saga and the situation in Ukraine. Fines, visas and Britain's support for Ukraine were all topics of conversation. So let's have a look now. One thing, though, that you have been repeatedly questioned on, and we see this week that, you know, 20 people yes. get fines yes. in a number 10 Downing Street. People talk about the party gate as they were going through sort of great upset and turmoil. What is your answer to that now that 20 people have been I, I, fined? I, 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 look, first of all, just to back to what I was saying about people's feelings about lockdown and the, the, the point you were making about some things feeling inhuman to, to people. I, I totally understand why people feel uh, as, as they do and uh, why people have been so um, uh, enraged. Uh, of course I understand that. And um, I, I've, I've apologised for things that we got wrong in, in number 10. Uh, Have you got uh, it happened, under control, number 10, uh, of, now? Of, of course, uh, of course. Uh, but, uh, of, but on what actually uh, happened, the, the um, you know, the details, a lot of nonsense has been talked, but I just think it's much better if I, if I wait until the conclusion of the, uh, of the inquiry before saying anything, anything further. I've said I won't comment on it. Uh, what I will do is, is say much more at the say much more at the end. And what we're getting on, with, I've got to let the police get on with their job. Can I just ask a general question of you, yes. Prime Minister? We're, we're here in the Thatcher room. I know. And um, you know, we, everybody knows what Mrs. Thatcher believed in. You know, she believed in individual freedom, individual responsibility, the free market, low taxes, sound money. That's you know, we all know what Thatcherism is. I just wonder, what is Johnsonism? <laughs> what, does, what are the guiding things that, that anchor your... your giving approach? everybody every, throughout this country the opportunities that they deserve commensurate with the talents and uh, initiative that they have. It's about levelling up. Because, and I think that's why people came to us in, uh, in 2019 uh, and why, in spite of all the difficulties that... Uh, the, the government has mm. faced, whether, whether it's a Ukraine or uh, the, uh, the pandemic or, or, or getting Brexit done, uh, people can see that this is a government that has a mission. And it's a, it's a, it's a moral uh, economic uh, mission at the same time. And it's about making sure that the whole of the UK 
prospers and succeeds in the way that it can. I, I know there was more we should have done to get HS2 to, uh, to Bradford. To get rid of HS2. No, 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 to scrap no, no, HS2, no, no, Boris. Get, to scrap no, it's it. about Northern Powerhouse Rail. And what you need to do is give those areas the same confidence mm. that comes from you they, knowing they have, they have a commuter style network and then we, we'd all agree that, 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 that enables enables country. people so if you're if you're if you're if you're living in the west midlands so andy street's vision uh, for the west midlands is one that we've got to drive forward I mean, when we did the nor the the integrated rail plan i mean that was an incredible thing we were shortening journey times and we were, we are going it's the biggest investment in rail this country has seen but prime minister uh, and, and, the question and, yeah, at the moment uh, it all has happened, to be i got beaten up by philip for not putting a fast enough link into 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 bradford when we're shut, we're cut, cutting all those journey times uh, but can across I the ask whole you of the about country the cost of living is that yes. going to be the biggest issue coming forward, the cost well, of living. Well, it already is. It absolutely it already is. is. And it's going to get, it's going it's to get, get worse. It is, and yes, and it is. for some of us conservatives, yeah. we would have said, what can we do to, to help people with the cost of living? We would have said, cut the taxes. We would have said, cut VAT on fuel. You've chosen not to do that. Why? Esther, I don't know whether you were, you were for that, but the spring statement was the biggest tax cut. If you take together the uh, the what Rishi did on the Nick's thresholds, which was completion of a promise, fulfillment of a promise that I made uh, in 2019. Some of us had questioned Nick as well. Why would we ever no, increase so, it? Sorry, no, but we, so we, we, what we, we raised the threshold to which before yes, you, pay, you pay Nick's, right? Yeah. But which, some of us are even questioning which, which even took, increasing the Nick threshold. No, no, no. But if you increase the threshold, mm. what that does is that takes people out of paying. Yes, yeah. And, and so we raised it from 9,000 to 12,000. And that it w w literally takes 70% of the, of the payers of, uh, of national insurance contributions uh, got a tax cut as a, as a result of what Rishi did on the, in the spring statement. Uh, it was the, literally the biggest tax cut in the last 10 years. The biggest tax cut. If you add that to the, what he said about income tax, uh, and... Uh, by the way, she, Next. She, <laughs> she, she had income tax, you know, very stuff. By the way, don't forget, uh, at times of difficulty, Mrs. Thatcher had uh, state spending running very, very high as a proportion of GDP because of the economic difficulties that the country was in. So, so you know, something like COVID, I think she would have dealt with in exactly the same way. What she would not have done, Philip, is said we could, we've got to borrow more. And there are some people who say we should, we should, we should just borrow more and, and, and risk uh, interest rates going up and spend uh, and, and, and run that risk. We're already spending £83 billion a year servicing our, our debts. Uh, that's crazy. We've got to keep a tight grip on it. Uh, so if you, just, if you just cut taxes, you've got to find the money from somewhere. We've already cut taxes very considerably. But we need to make sure that we invest in our NHS at the same time. And so the cost of living crisis is, is best fixed by tackling the immediate problems people are facing, cost of, uh, of, of fuel, uh, helping people with their, their heating costs, the, the whole 9.1 billion package that R Rishi has put together, but also making sure that people have high wage, high skilled jobs. That, that in the end is what, is what the, the Thatcher revolution delivered. What we want is high wage, high skilled jobs with a great deal of security so that people can know that they have the freedom and the opportunity to do things that they want to, like buy their own home. Uh, like and I, uh, I know, have I know the we're running out of time. I know we've only got a certain amount of time uh, with you. Um, and I just, have I talked? Have I have I talked? My, have I filibustered yeah, my I, way through this? Yes, you did. You <laughs> and I just wondered if you did want to answer anything, if there is time, on uh, Zelensky. I think most of the world will accept that the UK have been leading the way in helping Ukraine. President Zelensky said that himself. We were on a parliamentary delegation to the US last week where they acknowledged how we'd been mm -hmm. leading the world in supporting Ukraine. I just wondered how you saw the conflict ending and w what more we can do to help those Ukrainians who are seeking refuge in the UK who are sort of being held up by the sort of form filling and bureaucracy. Yeah. If there was mo any more we could do to be able to get them out of Ukraine a bit quicker. Yeah. So f first of all, on helping the, the Ukrainians to, to come here, uh, we've, we've already given visas to tens of, I think, almost 30,000 people. Uh, and, that, and the number is, is climbing 
quite fast. And you know, that's a, that's a good sized uh, town now, and it will continue to grow. British people have shown him amazing um, generosity, mm. warm heartedness. Yeah. 200,000 homes, families are uh, open for uh, Ukrainians to come here. What those women and children want is to be back in their own homes. And so, to, to your first point, uh, we've got to make sure that Putin fails in his catastrophic attempt to conquer, subdue, destroy another country, a, a neighboring Slavic country. And the UK is not. Uh, in the business of in, engaging itself or, or NATO in uh, direct conflict with uh, with Russia, that would that would not be sensible. But what we can do is give them maximum uh, economic, uh, political, and military support to Ukrainians to defend themselves. And what this what this war has revealed is that uh, Putin was fundamentally wrong in that bizarre essay that he wrote. He was fundamentally wrong. He said that Ukraine wasn't really a proper country and that it should be part of Russia, essentially. That has proved to be the diametric opposite of the case. The Ukrainians love their country. They will fight to the end for their country. There is no way that Putin can now succeed. That is the brute, the brute unarguable fact of the case. Uh, what we have to do now is make sure that uh, we continue to give the Ukrainians the help and support that they need. Continue to intensify the the sanctions and, uh, and continue to, to show to show to show uh, more uh, more military support and other support. And on intelligence, I think that uh, yeah, I think that if you look back at the at the previous few few weeks, it was clear that uh, U.S. and U.K. intelligence was was pretty much on the money. Prime Minister, thank you so much. Thank you both very much. It's been an honour. It's been surprised. It's been surprised. I thought you were going to. I thought that was going to be much, much more, more. Particularly about. I was worried about. I knew the chocolate oranges was coming. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you for your time. I'm sorry we haven't. Been, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's been so long delayed. But uh, but. Um, no, we, hey, listen. You had have, a lot on your plate. Even sure. if it was a chocolate orange. <laughs> <laughs> They're very good chocolate oranges. <laughs> We now know what he likes. Exactly. Chocolate Absolutely. oranges. We didn't, oh. we didn't reference ever a chocolate orange. That's you. Anyway, that might be true. That might be true. Henry Hill is still with us to talk about that uh, interview there. At the start, he said he had a grip on number 10 after Partygate. Has he? I mean, but I hope so. But you know, I've been covering, you know, we cover Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party professionally, and it's remarkable how often we hear about Downing Street, even before Partygate. The, 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 the extent to which rows between his advisers dominated the government's agenda was extraordinary. So maybe he finally does, and he's kicked the habits of a lifetime, but I'm not sure I believe it. Now, in that section, Henry, he, he talks about Johnsonism. I asked him what Johnsonism was. Uh, he seemed to say it was about levelling up, I think was what I got out of it. Can, can you do a better job of Johnsonism. defining... Johnsonism doesn't exist. Um, to any functional extent, Johnsonism doesn't exist. It's a load of aspirations and slogans with no delivery plan. You know, they've backed down on planning, they've backed down on building HS2, they'll probably back down on quite a lot more. There's a lot of nice aspirations. You saw it in the education plan. You know, we're going to get 90% of children achieving X, Y, or Z. Do they say how they're going to do it? No. That's the best summary of Johnsonism I can give you. And the tax issue, obviously, we are or want to see low tax. We never wanted to see the increase in national insurance contributions. We've got the highest tax rate, you know, for 70 odd years. This is not what we as Conservatives would want to the see. The thing to ask every Conservative Chancellor from henceforth is fiscal drag. The fact that uh, tax thresholds are not linked to inflation means that once we start having high inflation, more and more tax are going to get sucked into higher rates of tax, and the Chancellor is not going to have to declare it. Parliament won't have to vote for it. So that's what you should always press Conservative politicians on. Because if they're talking about, you know, oh, we're cutting, the, we're cutting the rate, but they're letting millions of people get sucked into the higher rate without telling anyone, they're not low-tax Conservative in my book. Henry Hill, thank you very much indeed for joining us today.
Looking ahead to this evening's weather, and the UK is looking bright for many, with the majority of the showers fading away. Let's take a look at the details. Zooming into the southwest of England, and it will be a fine end to the day here with plenty of sunshine. It will quickly begin to feel chilly, though, once the sun begins to set. Moving eastwards, and there could be one or two showers around first thing this evening, but these will quickly ease away, leaving clear skies. Across then into Wales.